So at the end of the year, it was not a very good year. We, I don't think we made the playoffs, but he took me to lunch and he said, uh, at the end of lunch, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bonus. I said, well, what for? He said, because you always said you wanted to make a billion bucks. My next paycheck had an extra $250,000 in it. I mean, my- that, that's awesome. And way to drop the hint, Mike. <laughs> way to drop it. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious and I don't care. <laughs> Uh, I want to welcome you. Mike Milberry has uh, been an NHL player. Uh, He was a sports announcer with NBC, played 12 seasons in the NHL, and all for one team, which does not happen anymore, the Boston Bruins. Mike, welcome. I could start so many places, Colgate, the Bruins, um, NBC, and I think it'll be NBC because I want to um, address what happened to you given the culture of today, the cancel culture and all the nonsense, uh, a lot of it that uh, I think a lot of us have to go through and witness every day. Um, you having to leave NBC because a comment that you made, um, can you... Like, get us into the details of that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, it was the, uh, it was in the bubble. And actually, you know, I, a bunch of our guys didn't want to go to the bubble. So they asked me if I would go. You know, I was, what, 67 or something. And I, I'd had cancer a couple of years ago, but I, good team player, Chris. So I, I trotted off to Toronto where I was doing sometimes two games a day. Um, and it was really kind of a weird situation, as you know, nobody in the stands and uh, guys separated all the time. But at one point during the game, uh, Brian Boucher brought up the fact that uh, this could be conducive to, uh, you know, just focusing on hockey. And he went on about it a little bit. I, I didn't bring up the conversation. It was he that teed it up. And, uh, and, I, and I just jumped on at the end. I said, you know, th- you're right. There's, there, are, there are no distraction here distractions here there aren't even any women here and that was it so I went home home back to the hotel the back to the Royal York and it was uh the next morning I got a call from Sam Flood who's the executive producer of NBC Sports and um he said we got a problem I said well what's the problem he said well your comment last night and I had to ask him what the comment was um but he said it's upset some people, and then, I, and then he said you're going to have to apologize. And so uh, the PR people called me, and I said, "Write whatever the fuck you want. I don't really care because I can't can't take this seriously right now. I can't, you know." And I've done it before. I, Sam would have to come to me if I insulted somebody like Ovechkin on the Capitals, and Ted Leontes would call, Batman Bet would call Sam Flood, and then he'd come running to me. So I was kind of used to this pattern. Um, and so I apologized, and, and uh, I don't even, I couldn't tell you what I said. I just, to put my name on the thing yeah. and, and let it go. Then about uh, four o'clock that afternoon, the NHL came out with a statement condemning my statement. Um, as being non-inclusive and I don't know what other terms they used. That was, it was, it's been a while now, but it was, they weren't very kind. And it was basically calling me a misogynist. I got a call from Sam Flood. I had gone home. I had, they sent me home and I got a call from Sam Flood that you're not going to be back for the rest of the playoffs. I said, really? And he said, yeah, really. And then a few days later, I got a call from him again, and he said, well, we're not bringing you back at all. First, he told me we were going to talk about next year's schedule after the season was over, but then they had a change of heart and said, we're not bringing you back. And I said, what about my paycheck? I still had another year and a few months left on the paycheck, and he said, you'll get paid in full. And I just, I, I really didn't have much to say to him because I couldn't believe it. I stand by my comment. I mean, 
<laughs> women have been distracting me all my life. I mean, it's just the way it is. And I, it's and not, I, it's I, not that women are distractions. It's just that we're scumbags that can't yeah. focus. Right? Like, like, I mean, well, it's hard know. when they, you know, they get dolled up and makeup and, you know, nice hairdo and shapely figures. And, uh, I, you know, okay. So I could have said there aren't any wives or girlfriends there or something, but I, I really, I was kind of stunned by it. But I wasn't going to make a fuss over it because they were going to pay me. So I kept my mouth shut for like whatever length of term it was. And then when my last paycheck came in, I gave Dan Sha Shaughnessy, who's a columnist for the Globe down here in Boston, <clears throat> and he let me have my say. And I said basically that I didn't care what the, the league had to say or what NBC had to say, but you, they, they can't cancel me. They said the only guy that's going to cancel me is the Grim Reaper. And I can see him off in the distance, but he's not here yet. I'm not. I'm not going to refuse to be canceled for that. For that comment, it was it was absurd. It was not intentionally being harmful. And a couple of female reporters and the new policewoman on the staff at the NHL, who's who's charge of uh, in inclusivity and you know just the thought police, basically, was upset yeah. with it. And so. You know, here I am. I'm on Cape Cod trying to play golf at my advanced age, you know, working out, um, do a little broadcasting with WEI. But in the end, I, I'm I'm still staggered by it. Um, when, when NBC lost the contract, TNT and um, ESPN picked up the ball and I had an agent give them a call and they, they, they it was a non-starter. My name was a non-starter. So, I mean, I, the doors were closed and uh, I'll have to live with that. But, at, you know, my stage, I was ready for it. And like financially, I was planning because you can't, you have to do that. And so, but I'm still pissed about it. Well, I don't blame you. And listen, you've always been up front and you've told it like it is. I love that about you. There was a time, I think, um, a lot of people didn't. Now, the Subban thing, when you comment that when he hit his head, I was fine with that. You kidding me? He had it coming. Um, yeah, he'd been know, punching Crosby. Crosby a whole time. Like, yeah. you, you would have done this. You would have punched yeah. him in the head, too. It was yeah. it was fine. Yeah, but everybody's so damn sensitive today. And the comments with Crosby and the comments with Ovechkin. Do you think this was kind of a culmination of it. This was like the last straw for Mike and we're, we, we can't deal with this anymore. My God. Yeah. I, I don't think it was just that one thing. I think it was, let's, this is a pain in the ass, but now you got people that are, by the way, I, I had death threats after that Subban comment. I was in Nashville at the hotel. I got a phone call from a, from somebody who said, we know where you're staying. We know what time you go to the rink and we're going to get you. I mean, we, oh. NBC had to hire a, bro, a bodyguard, and it wasn't the oh. first time. They actually had to do it at the, the Olympics. I think I made some Canadian comments. But anyway, uh, I was kind of shocked that I had this guy following me around with his pistol and his holster on his hip. But uh, I, I think you're right, Chris. I think it was not just that comment, but, uh, they, you know, you, new day and age, and everybody wants milk toast comments quietness yeah. just have a good laugh don't really get into anything in detail in terms of analysis it's more like coffee with the with the analysts now how about this one do you think if just say you know now there's a new women's league and they're doing the league and there's a, a woman up there and and they're in the bubble and they come out and say, listen, it's awesome. We're in the bubble here, and it's great that there's no men around to distract us. Do you think the shoe being on the other foot, it would have been ha handled the <laughs> same way? I, I doubt it, right? I, I don't know, but it's, you know. I, I, I would have been offended. Lost. I would have been offended. I would have been offended. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fucking distraction. Yeah, you know, and Mike, I didn't know you had cancer, and I, I'm glad to hear you're doing well. Uh I didn't hear that, but uh, anyway, I just want to say um, I'm happy for that. But I was talking to Tim before we were shooting the breeze about you and uh, you as a player. And I go back and uh, I think you, Colgate days and you, you were a hardworking guy. You were a guy that showed up. You were a good team player. You were never the best guy in the, out in the ice. There's no question about that. Like me, 
and uh, you made an awesome career for yourself. And you played with some of the greatest players that ever played the game, from Orr to Brad Park to, to Ray Bork, you mentioned him. Um, and then that career ends and you go into the coaching. Now, I got to tell you, and I told Tim this, I said, Mike Milbury is the type of guy that I would go through a fucking wall for. And one of the big reasons is, I, other than, yeah, I had respect for you, but I knew you would have fucking went through the wall with me. Now, I had a lot of coaches that, uh, yeah, I had some coaches I would go through the wall for. I would. But I know they wouldn't go through with me. And uh, you were one of those that would. And I had nothing but respect for you that way. And I remember coming to Boston, and I want to get into that right off the top too, the All-Star nomination for me. And I'll never forget, you come up to me in the ice that day, you're skating around, you say, hey, you're going to the All-Star game. I'm there, will you fuck off, you know? I'm there, will you fuck off? You're kidding me. And and he's, no, I'm not. You said, you're going to the All-Star game. I'm picking you and Brian Scridland. And I, I mean, I was shocked. I was almost, in, and I shouldn't be embarrassed, but I was almost embarrassed by it. And honestly, when I look back, and I have this shirt, I have the shirt up in my room here. I gave one to my brother, and I kept the other one. And, you know, it's a shame I didn't get to play, and you know why that happened. But but I, I'll never forget that, and it meant a lot to me that you did that when I look back on it. I'll forever be indebted for it. Well, and you took a lot of shit, Bob. Uh, yeah, they actually changed the rules after that year, right? So they, they, yeah. they took the privilege of choosing people, but it was... It was meant to be certainly a complimentary gesture to you and Brian, but you know, if you're going to have an all-star game, um, you might as well have stars that, that are stars in different aspects of the sport. And both of you guys were in your own right, stars at playing hard nosed hockey, playing fighting, you know, being the kind of player that every other guy in the league would be happy to have you as a teammate. And I thought it was time that, you know, we tip the cap to the guys that, that allow the special players, the skilled players, to do some of the things that they do. And I, I, I certainly would do it again. Um, and I, you, know, you and Scrudlin both getting hurt was really a pain in the ass. Crazy. And Gary yeah. Galley, too, at the time. Gary Galley was a bit of a surprising yeah. pick, although he did make another all-star team. He, But he was, he was the same kind of approach. He went play as hard as he could play and tipping the cap to guys like that, not just being the skilled nifty players is I think a fair thing to do. And certainly it would have been better if you could have worn the Jersey on the ice, it would have spiced up the game, which was uh. like 13 to nine or something. I remember getting on the bus going to the, to the practice rink. I said, uh, Paul coffee was on the team. I said, guys, do you think we could just play a little defense today? And he looks at me and says, Mike, there's no money in defense. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. No, uh, that is cool. That's cool that you did that because, you know, Chris really appreciates it. And he was, you know, Chris is an asshole. I agree with you. He doesn't really. <laughs> no, but he was added all compliments about you. And I think today it's kind of funny because like today's all like guys don't even want to go today. So it's an all-star game happens. The guys are like, oh, my shoulder. And they're like trying to get out of it. So I just think that was cool that you tried to do that with Chris because obviously he. It's, you know, he really appreciates it. So that's cool. Well, I, I wish yeah. you'd been there because, you know, it was right at the start of the Gulf War and it was in the old Chicago yeah. Stadium. And I forget the name of the, the old anthem singer from Chicago was ready to be yeah. belted it out. The national anthem, the place went absolutely bonkers. It was really a highlight of my career. Wayne Mesmer. Wayne Mesmer. Wayne Mesmer. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> yeah, Thank <yeah>. you. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, it was really, a, it was a stirring moment. Uh, on the ice, on the bench. I'll, I'll never forget it. But sorry you couldn't make it. Yeah, it was a drag. And again, you know, I, I ended up having surgery on my ankle. And I, I had even mentioned that story to Tim, how I went out and played basketball on the parquet and broke my ankle. Uh, not a lot of fun. But um, yeah, and it, let, let's get back to, uh, you know, you being an American kid coming in at the time you did. Like, it was almost unheard of at that time. You know, there weren't man, many Americans in the league. No. Uh, coming in from Colgate University, you didn't play junior. Um, how difficult was that on you in your early days as a player 
you know, finding your way uh, in yeah. the NHL. I mean, I, I really I wasn't drafted. Uh, yeah. And I'm a senior at Colgate, so now that makes me, what, 22, which these days is an old player for NHL standards. But I, I, uh, we're playing in the Syracuse Invitational Tournament uh, at the old War Memorial in Syracuse. And my mother happened to come up to the game. And uh, my mother's narcoleptic, which means she just nods off to sleep. So she's yep. got to take a little mother's helper every now and again, which is a little yep. dexedrine or something. So we won the first game of the tournament. And uh, I played a ton. I played just a ton. So I was really tired. And I went over to visit my mother. Not That's the, not the only reason I went, though, Chris. I went to yeah, get some no, of get her little mother's helper's pills. So I reached yeah, in, yeah, grabbed a little dexedrine, you. and popped it about an hour before the game. Hit everything in sight. Everything. Just killed people all over the place. We lost the game. But that night, the Bruins put me on their negotiation list. It means you fell through the cracks as a draftee. They had four, four, every team had four players that they could put on a negotiation list. So that's how I, I got noticed. And uh, I got called up to the, the, the Boston Braves at the time to play a handful of games. But, you know, I went through the whole summer, didn't hear from them until almost the 1st of August. But finally, the Bruins got a hold of me and gave me the formal invite to camp. <clears throat> but I got there, you know, it was first, first we had uh, the day before camp started, they had a, a golf and tennis tournament um, at a nearby, the International is out in Bolton. And it yep. was like, it was unbelievable. Start the day with a luncheon, you know, Heineken and silver buckets. And this is before the golf and tennis tournament. So bands playing on the patio overlooking the golf course. So then we go out and play golf and tennis and we come back for dinner. More bands, more Heineken, more wine. And the guys are just falling all over the place. Like, I like this. This is like, these are my like heroes. They're just, but they're, oh, that's a change, know, right? Just, and uh, oh. so I actually, I, I, so I got <laughs> out of there quickly because I was not in a, in a position where I could be having that kind of fun. And I, I get to the rink. I'm two hours early and it's about the, the big guys are ready to play. And I go into the locker room and Espo's over at the corner and he's the only guy left. It's like two minutes to eight when practice is supposed to be start. And Bobby walks in and I hide around the corner. I haven't met him yet. And he, and he starts yelling at Phil. Phil, what the fuck are you doing, Phil? You're going to be late for practice. It's Don Cherry's first day as the new coach. And you, we didn't win the fucking cup last year. Get your ass on the ice. It was like I was shaking my head like, welcome yeah. to, you know, Alice in Wonderland here. Anyway, I got on the ice and I, I had been in, I, you know, those guys, it was like a six week training camp back then. So guys would play yeah. their way into shape. And I was so far ahead of everybody. I mean, they didn't even know what stretching was then. They didn't know how to stretch. They, yeah. didn't, know to, they didn't know how to do interval training or any of that stuff. And so I was, I was way ahead of the pack when it came to that. But there was no shortage of like, you know, I had a, a stick fight with Cash, Wayne Cashman. Yeah. And uh, welcome to the yeah, league. And, and, man. And, and at one point, he, you know, he turned it over. You know, so yeah. the point was down. And that's when I, oh, Jesus. Some fortunately. That's when you're in yeah, trouble. <laughs> I got people that were telling me that I had to slow down because I was making them look bad. And yeah. I didn't listen to any of that. But I had a whole bunch of, a uh, whole bunch of fights. But the guy that made the difference for me was, I never even know his name, it was in Springfield. And uh, we, I came out at the end of a power play. I don't know, just two seconds left, but there was like a fight broke out. So it was the four penalty killers and four of our guys and then me. And I, I was standing beside Doug Gibson, pretty good player and a pretty good coach. Yeah. And, and some guy had him. And I went over to grab his opponent too. So it was kind of two on one. And the guy got frisky and threw a punch at me. And I, so I had never really been in a fight before, like on the ice. Yeah. And I just wailed on him. And the guy never threw another punch. I never, he never threw one other punch. And I mean, that was, that sealed my fate as a, you know, a guy that was going to get a contract. So that's how it yeah. got started. And it took a couple of years in the minors. You know, the first year, you know, I, I was expecting to go to Rochester. And the second year, though, I played really well in training camp. And Grapes called me and said, Mike, uh, I want you to get a place. You've made the club. You know, so I'm like, wow, this is awesome. And uh, the next day, I go to practice. I get a call 
to come to Grape's office again, but this time Harry's there. And Harry says, well, Mike, we're sending it to Rochester. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. man! And I pouted. Thanks. For, I pouted <laughs> for about two months before I finally got it back on on track. And uh, but my my breakthrough came in uh, came in Buffalo. I got a, I was in I was in New Haven, and you know it's a long way. We play in New Haven, and after the game, the coach says to me, "You can play tomorrow in Buffalo." But before that Buffalo game, I had to drive like eight hours from New Haven to back to Rochester, get in at like 4.30 in the morning, get a couple hours of sleep, then drive to Buffalo. So Bruins had pretty much won the, the, the division championship, but, you know, I had a couple games left. And uh, so I thought I'm playing okay. Buffalo is a good team. They got the French connection, Danny Gare, you know, they, yeah. they have some good players. And so it's like midway through the second period, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, Grapes comes to the end of the bench where I'm sitting with a defenseman. He said, what happened to you? What happened to you, you college commie pinko fag? Hit somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I thought I was playing okay. So, That's child we got, abuse Yeah, today. we got to cancel that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and midway through the third, he comes down to the end of the bench again and says, what the fuck happened to you? You college commie pinko faggot. <laughs> I just, oh, I, had, I had no idea how to handle that. But fortunately, uh, we went to Toronto. It's another story that I should save for another time. But, but anyway, we went to Toronto. I got in a fight with Pat Boutet. And uh, yeah. that made Grapes' his day. So I stuck yeah, around I'm after sure. that. But it was not. You guys, you guys ever get into it? Like you guys played against each other, right? You guys we did it? once. It wasn't much of a battle, yeah. but it was. Like I, you know, I'm not stupid. I didn't want to fight Knuckles. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm going to fight him. He's going to kick the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. Now, I got to tell you that one story <laughs> that we, we almost had a fight when he was playing for Northeastern. Yeah. We, we had a, we had a, uh, we had a, uh, an exhibition game. Fernie Flam and ex-Bruin was the coach at Northeastern. So we go over to Northeastern to play the college pukes. And uh, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm coming around the net. And uh, one of Knuckles' teammates, well, Mark Coates, Mark Coates, the little uh, guy, takes a run at prick. my knees, like and yeah. comes down low. So I grabbed him. I don't know what I was going to do with him, but I, all of a sudden the bench is clear, and I find myself grabbed by somebody, and it's like a it's like a <laughs> vice grip on my shoulder. Like <laughs> what the hell is this? This is just a college kid, you know. I, I, I and I look over and. Uh, and there he is in all his glory, Nyland, ready to go to town on me. Fortunately, O'Reilly came over and said... Oh, fortunately, <laughs> yeah. yes. I was like, okay. <laughs> O'Reilly came over and said, uh, take your time there, big boy. And that yeah, thing sort of said, settled down. Yeah, he said, enough, boys. You know, that's it. Settle down here. And, you know, I, I did. I wasn't that stupid. But, you know, me being a teammate... I knew what he did it was stupid to begin with, but I still had to be there for him, right? Our teammates yeah. have done stupid things before, and you still have to be there for him. So I was, but I'm glad that did not escalate any further. I just couldn't believe it. And so that must have been so embarrassing for poor Fernie Flamin, right? Yeah. Having the Bruins come over to play his team, and then that happens. But that Mark Coates, he was a little prick. You know, he's one of those little Canadians that thought they were better than all the Americans. He just was. We're better than you. And certainly they were all devastated because Northeastern had a lot of Canadians, right, Mike? Right. And a lot of them, well, I think, were in um, shock when I ended up in the NHL. And none of them did. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I got so a lot they, of that, too. I got yeah. guys calling me when I was like two years into guys from high school looking for tryouts at 26. <laughs> like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, but it was a long, it was a slog. Yeah. So you played for Grapes, obviously. Grapes, controversial guy, says what he wants. That must have been just awesome playing for that guy, though. One thing your first year, and I remember as a kid, I was at the game when the B set the record they had what is it, 11 players with over 20 goals? Bobby Miller was the last one to do right. it. I was at the game. Yeah. He had his 19th. He was going for his 20th, and he got it that game. Yeah, no, was it 11 players? Yeah, 11 guys scored 20 goals. 
But, you know, and Grapes used to always brag about that. I said, what the fuck, Don? What about the rest of us who are playing defense while these guys are scoring fucking 20 <laughs> goals? I mean, piss me off, really, honestly. I was happy they got 20 goals, but, geez, you know, my job was to keep the puck out of the net. But there was no better guy to play for. You talked about coaches that you'd go through the wall for. Well, he was one of them. I mean, it was a, there was nobody with them. Like, there was not 16 different coaches there. Yeah, it was just really? Grapes standing behind the bench. And controlling everything. And so, and he kept it as, you know, third man high. Yeah. The yeah. breakout play was rip it around the wall and let Cashman <laughs> and Marcotte high stick their way through any pinching defenseman. Yeah. We'll get out of the zone. We'll dump it in. We'll go two men on the four check and a third guy high. And we'll just pound it whenever we can at the net and take yeah. no prisoners. You knew where you stood. Um, you usually needed a whipping boy, though, Graves. So I, he, he always had somebody. Like Dwight Foster was a whipping boy for him. I hate to be on the wrong side of Graves, but he, he usually had somebody that he could pick on. But the rest of us, as long as he got the effort and as long as we were willing to stand up in terms of a fight, um, you weren't going to have any trouble with Don. It was, it was sad the way it ended, you know. Him and Harry, right, are very similar, and right? Like, when you talk about hard guys. Yeah. And you figured that had to end sometime. But go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted. But well, that's okay. Those no, two, I mean, you're right. They, it, it, both are the two most important hockey figures in my life. I mean, Harry yeah. later gave me a, a chance to go to Maine and become a general manager and coach and then brought me up to Boston to be a coach and assistant GM. But, and he was great about talking to him about anything hockey-wise. Um, and so we go to the finals, we lose to the, your Canadians in four games in the first year, second year, six games, we lose in the finals. And the third year is in 1978, 79. And we lose too many men on the ice game. And you guys oh. know what happened there it was crushing. It was just, it was, you know, it was 15 seconds. I was too still many a Bruins on. fan. Though I was still a Bruins fan, by the way, even though I've been drafted, it fucking crushed me that you guys yeah. lost that game. But d- during that series, I can remember uh, Harry came up to me. We're at the airport in Montreal, and he started to talk about our penalty killing. You know, and Harry was Harry was a hell of a coach, and yeah. uh, he made a few comments. And then I get on the bus, and Grape says t- to me, "Mike, what are you doing talking to that guy?" I said, well, it's a general manager, Don. What do you want me to just <laughs> tell him the fuck off? I can't do that. But they were, it got to the point where they couldn't talk to each other. And it was, it was sad because I think they did have a very good relationship for some time. And then it just, you know, grapes, you know, it might have been a little, co- I call it coaching disease, where you think you can do, you're, you know, you're the be all end all. And, and, you know, you forget you need your general manager and your players. And I'm not saying that grapes was there all the way, but he, he did, you know, he did play hard with Harry. And in the end he got burnt. He wound up going to Colorado. It didn't turn out well for him there. And fortunately he became one of the legends of broadcaster. But, but I, I, I just think that the chance to play for grapes was a chance to be joyous about hockey almost every day. You could go to the rink and know it was going to be fun. I mean, he, and he used to make me drive to the rink with him. Uh, on game days, I drive to the rink with him. We come from the North Shore, you know Boston. So we come yeah. down Route One, which is like two lanes in both directions, separated by this little median strip, metal median strip. So we're going in regularly together. And, uh, and by the way, every day when we went home, we would stop at Kowloon's Chinese restaurant, yeah, pick up uh, mm-hmm. spare ribs for us to eat in the car on the way home. You know, eat a rib, throw it out the window, and uh, and then. <laughs> specials for he and his wife but anyway we're, we're going in on the on route one and he we start looking at, at this weed grapes points out this weed it's growing like long and strong in the middle of the road he said that weed that's a bruin type weed that's what that is that's a that weed should be a bruin and so and every day we're talking about the goddamn weed so it's now like mid-april and what do they do in mid-april they clean the, the they clean the, the streets so he sees the 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 sweeper coming down route one, trying to clean stuff up along the, and he says, Mike, you have to get over there and get that weed for me. 
So, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, you, yeah. We got to <laughs> save that weed. So she stops on Blue Run is like one of the major thoroughfares yeah. in Boston. It's like traffic city. It's a jam all the time or people are going 50 miles an hour. So I'm dodging traffic, reaching over the median, trying to get the weed <laughs> by the roots. And we... I finally get it out of there, run it over to the car, and he stops at the first gas station, gets some newspaper, wets it, puts the weed into the news, wet newspaper, and drives like crazy to get home. And he plants it in and the- transplanted. He transplanted to his own garden. So about a, two weeks later, I said, Grapes, how's, the, how's our weed doing? She just says, well, Rose was out there cleaning out the garden. It's gone. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> the Bruins weed is gone. Oh. <laughs> But Great. it was, uh, it was, you know, there was always a reason to laugh. But he was, he was, you know, he's obviously got a personality that is yeah. big, larger than life, and carried that to new heights in this hockey night show. But uh, I got nothing but fond memories for days playing for him. What was it like playing with like Bobby or Ray Bork and those guys? Well, or like? or I really didn't get to play with because he was hurt. It was right at this like '74 when I came in, and he was literally on his last legs and i got to practice with him a few times and he it was like it was, it was like a dream he would serve, crazy right yeah he'd, he'd handle the puck go wherever he wanted to go with it then occasionally he'd pass it to me and i'd bank it off the glass and out of the zone <laughs> but uh, but but i did play with park and i played with bork i like to think that i got them both into the hall of fame but, but pretty good partners to have um, and, uh, Brad was unique in that his, his knees were also bad. I mean, they were really bad. I remember get him getting, you know, fluid taken out of his knee with a, a needle about eight inches long. I mean, just so he could play a game tough as nails, but he, he could just, uh, the shake of a head, move left or right. And people would just peel off. It was, it was remarkable. Um, you know, and Bork was a horse. I remember seeing him at his first training camp, 1979, in, in the fall after our demise. And um, first practice, he was out there and he reminded me immediately of Dennis Potvin. I mean, Potvin was at the peak of his powers. Yeah. And Bork just looked totally comfortable uh, in in playing in his first practice. It was, it was a remarkable thing to see. And he, he never looked back. I mean, when I, when I got the chance to coach him, which is kind of a joke, you don't coach Ray Bork, he just manages minutes. In fact, he, <laughs> yeah. you know, he, uh, basically he'd come back to the bench, he'd rest. And when he was ready to go, he'd stand up and I'd yell change. Hey. You know, <laughs> yeah. that was my, that's how I handled him. But, you know, he too was tough. I mean, he was tough one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we were playing Hartford uh, in a playoff run, and he got hurt. He got a hip pointer, so he couldn't play. And Hartford had us at, well, it was 3-3 going into game seven. They actually had us down 2-1, to one, and we came. We had a miracle comeback led by Poulin and Neely and a few other, Gary Galley and a few other guys. But it was, we were in, we were in trouble without Bork. So it's 5 o'clock, day of game seven, He's not skated now in two weeks. He, he, he comes into my office and says, I just went out and skated a bit. I, I think I can go. Well, what am I going to say? No, I watch out. Be oh, careful. Yeah. Don't hurt yourself, right? Get your goddamn uniform. <laughs> Stay right? home and watch Let's on go. the iPad. <laughs> First shift. I was, I was usually the guy on the ice that usually the coach was like, hey, change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but first shift. Makes an out big outlet pass to John Bice. John Bice scores the goal, and we're we're off and running, and we win the series. But I mean, he, he big minutes, big balls, great talent. I mean, he was uh, at both ends of the ice. He's been, I don't know if there's hey Potvin is a good example of the comparison. I think both guys were tremendous at. They weren't. They didn't have the thrill effect of of Orr. Uh, but they were efficient in so many ways at both ends of the ice. I mean, Solid, both of them, big time. Mike, you know, you, and you brought it up, and, and talking about Don Cherry and him leaving Boston, and I look at your time in Boston, and 
um, coaching and and then being assistant manager. Man, that was fucking cut out for you. And you fucking laugh. <laughs> yeah. You're fucking nuts. Because look, you said about Don Cherry. He went to Colorado and nothing was ever the same. When you went to New York, quite frankly, you know. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, Chris, I didn't keep coaching because I had a bunch of kids that I didn't want to, you know, coaches get fired all the time, right? Yeah, and yeah, more, and you're gone. Yeah, I get it. So I didn't want to just travel the country chasing coaching jobs. So I thought I'd, I'd work into the managing thing, which I thought was a safer profession. And uh, I actually, Harry sent me to Buffalo to meet with Jerry Jacobs. And... Uh, I guess in anticipation of naming me manager at that point, but he uh, he said uh, when I asked him, I said, "Listen, we got to spend some more money." And he said, "We'll get a new building down the line, and then we'll spend more money." I said, "But we got to spend a greater percentage of the profits right now on on talent." He said, "I like the percentages just the way they are." So mm. I got huffy over that. And uh, and decided that maybe my time wasn't all what's going to be. And you know, I don't. You, you kind of glossed over this. I actually left to become the head coach at Boston College. I know. I, and, know. I uh, was going to get there. I, I was. <laughs> I had. I had. You know. Always thought that that. I mean, I liked coaching, and you now I was going to take a pay cut to go there. But I, I was. You know, security. But, yeah, security. Kids and, in college. Right. So college, all the things, a lot of things that you could, you know, check off a box for. But um, I got there and um, it was a disaster. The previous coach was Steve Cedarchuk and he had promised scholarships. I was supposed to get eight scholarships my first year. I was going to have none. He had promised scholarships for the next four years to kids. And they came into my office in the first couple of weeks with letters uh, I said to the AD, I said, what the hell is this? What's going on here? I said, let me, you stay out of it. Let me take care of it. But I had a steady stream of kids and parents showing me their letters, showing me their commitment from Boston College, and we weren't doing anything about it. And finally, I said, I can't do this. So I was making like three fifty with the Bruins. And then BC was going to, I was going to be the highest paid college coach at about 150. And, uh, to, to making nothing. <laughs> so I walked out the door at BC and, you know, I was, so now I made myself a, a bit of a mess here. Or You, you know. couldn't go back the other way. You no, couldn't I couldn't go back, go back to, to Boston. No, that was, that was not something I would do or could do. And so I, I actually went to ESPN, but that was the year of the lockout. It was a lockout yeah. year. And I, I uh, fortunately had the foresight as a former player rep and a GM no, thought I was going to, thought it was going to be a, tough negotiation it might be a work stoppage I got them to put in a clause that they'd pay me anyway so the first couple of months I just sat home but we did finish the year uh broadcasting the games and uh at the end of that year uh, Don Maloney who was GM of the Islanders yeah came to me and and inquired about my availability and that my mistake was that I didn't really know what I was getting into there it was a yeah. it was an ownership disaster. There were the Pickett still owned the team, and John Pickett had been there for a long time, but had remarried and was living in Florida. And he had sold ten percent of the team to four local investors, and they were charged with running the team. Two of them went to jail, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, for, Mr. Spanos? No, 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 this is no, before him. That wasn't him, him yet? That's Steve, okay, Steve Walsh and the guy by the name of Greenwood. Uh, okay. And and they were jailed for their own fraudulent activities and their own investment companies. But, you know, whenever I had to do anything, I had to run it up the flagpole through these guys. And if there's yeah, anything I learned... Run it through the criminals. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> if they came in... Well, they fired Don... December of my first year and um, they were going to look for a new GM. And I said, listen, I didn't, I didn't really get along with Darcy Regeer very well. He was the assistant GM. Yeah. So you got to fire him and let me bring in my own guys. He said, no, we can't do it. It's too expensive. 
Now it's a ma manager, assistant manager at that point was like 125 bucks, thousand bucks. But anyway, so I got stuck with him and we batted heads for a long time. And I was doing both GM and coach taking over for Maloney and still trying to coach. And the, the team was bad. It was, That's it was, a lot. Was, That's a lot. Well, it's funny. I, at the, uh, end of the year, uh, I had to sit down with Bill Parcells, you know, who's famous for saying, you know, if, if you're going to, you want me to cook, you got to let me buy the groceries, right? So he wanted yeah. to be in charge of both the, the team on the on the football field and, and the, the personnel changes. So I sat down with him and he, he said, you know, you can do it. You need a staff to uh, to get you through it. But if you get the right staff, you can be a GM and a coach at the same time. So I did it and I sucked at both. I was terrible. Yeah. It was just too much to handle. And, I love uh, your honesty. I, uh, I, um, I was driving in my car. Eventually, I gave up the coaching to try to manage, but well, we'll get to that in a minute. But um, I'm driving down the highway on Long Island, and Parcells is being interviewed by Mike Francesa and the, on Mike and the Mad Dog at the time. So they're talking about all sorts of things. And so Francesa says, you know, if there's one thing you could do over again, in your career, what would it be, Bill? He said, I, I never would have tried to be general manager and coach at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for there the advice, go. coach. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus <Yeah>. Christ. <laughs> anyway, but that was just the start of the, 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 the owners originally came into me in January and said, you've got to cut the budget by 25%. Now, 25% of a budget that was already way too low was, was nuts. But I did that, we traded, Wendell Clark and Matthew Schneider. We got Toronto's first round pick and Kenny Johnson, who was a pretty good defenseman for a long time. A little softer than I'd like, but still <clears throat> a pretty good player. And then the next group that comes in is this Spano. And you know, this guy is, he's a beauty boy. I mean, he is. So it goes from bad to worse. Yes, bad to worse. Um, you know, my Spano story. It's a podcast, so I can go this far. I'm sitting at home. I'm, you know, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I get a call. John is at the <clears throat> Garden City Hotel. He's in the bar there. And he said, I want you to come over and, you know, meet me. So uh, it's pretty odd. It's like late. But anyway, so I get, get over to the bar. And he's got this little roped off area like he's king of Persia or something, right? <laughs> Grand pool. <Poole. clears throat> yeah, exactly. So he starts to talk for a little while. He's talking about hockey. And he leans over and says to me, they'll be here in a little while. I said, what do you mean, John? He said, the girls. First they'll do each other, then they'll do us. <laughs> 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 this is the owner. <laughs> Yahoo. <laughs> yeah. So I got Sounds like there. Jerry Buss, right? <laughs> Was it Jerry Buss's hero? Yeah. <laughs> Must have been. I snuck out the back door and, you know, that was the end of that. But he... He didn't last too long. And then we had Gluckster and Milstein, and they brought in some joker to supervise the place, and he was out yeah, to lunch. Yeah, just a mess, right? Yeah, it just kept going mess. from, from yeah. bad to worse, and Spano goes to jail, and then Charles, finally, you get to Charles Wong and Sanjay Kumar. Sanjay Kumar was partners with Charles Wong. He was running the show, and he gets arrested and thrown in jail for 13 years. For fraud mm -hmm. and like it just and then Charles comes to play and I, lo I listen I love Charles he's a, he, was a, he was a great guy passed away a few years ago but he was in my shorts constantly I mean just yeah, constantly uh -huh. you know I had a deal for uh, now you feel about Jason Allison but he was a pretty good player in his time and Peter Laviolette was our coach and he really liked him I had a deal all set up with him for uh, but Dave Scatchard was in the deal and I told. Charles about the deal. He said, you can't make that deal. And I said, well, why not? He said, because Dave Scatchard's in the deal. I said, yes, yeah, so what? He's the third line player and we're getting a quality centerman when we need one. And he said, no, you can't trade Scatchard. He's the kind of guy we want. He visits sick kids in hospitals. Oh, I said, oh, shit. <laughs> really? <laughs> so we blew that up and I kind of like, you know, I was, then we had to, you know, I, I was on the fringe now getting my walking papers so I wound up saying, ah, screw it. I'm just going to take as much money as for as long as I can. We traded for Ashen, which we traded for Michael Pekka. 
picked up Chris Osgood, and we had a 45 point, 44, 45 point resurgence. We gained that many points. One of the, I think the forced highest leap by any team in NHL history at the time. And so, but Yashin was never going to win a championship nope. and never going to. Yeah. Gonna, no, and nobody remembers that. Yeah. You do though. Yeah. Oh right? yeah. I, I, <laughs> well, I, I can go on and on with Charles. Like we're, we're negotiating with Rick DiPietro who's coming off his entry level contract and he was making a million bucks. And I said, Charles, there's a lot of questions about this kid. You know, he looks like he could be a, a real good player, but he's a bit of a wild card. So let's go easy here. So I said, well, you know, maybe a million and a quarter or something like that. So they're not having any of that, D. D. Pietro. And Orr was his, his uh, Paul Kropelka and Orr were the, the agents. So yeah. he said, well, get it to a million and a half. He said, but if for every day he doesn't take it, you're going to take $50,000 off. Now, how do you think an agent's <laughs> going to handle that, right? So yeah. I tell him, and, you know, I happen to have uh, a meeting with Charles the next day, like a, a dinner with some people from advertising and all that kind of stuff. So we get there the next day and he pulls me aside and he said, uh, Mike, we signed Di Pietro. I said, what do you mean we signed Di Pietro? I said, <laughs> what did we give him? He said, we gave him $2 million for two years. I said, what? I, oh. said, How am I, what do you, I said, do you, do you know what you just did to me? You just like, just ripped the heart out of me. I, I might as well just hand you my walking papers right now. It's like, it's just talk about undermining your general manager. But he was always, you know, he he was always around. Yashin was always at his house. They were best buddies. Di Pietro was there too. It was just, it was not the way to run a hockey team. But a one, the one common thread I found from all the ownership changes there, one thing I could say about Jerry Jacobs is he never gets involved. He let Harry get do the whole thing business-wise. Maybe he had some probably tough conversations about the bottom line at the end of the year, but he let the, the hockey guys do the hockey stuff. The new day and age owner wants his hands in your pants all day long to, 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 to get involved, and they think they can use the same principles in the hockey world that they use in their own private dealings, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, we're in conversation with Mike Milbury, a uh, former NHL, Boston Bruin coach, general manager, and uh, analyst for NBC for years. Uh, it's awesome to have you here today, Mike. Timmy, what do you got, buddy? No, I was just going to didn't DP, I thought DP, when did DP, didn't DP Hitro sign for like 40 years or something? Like, yeah, and I had nothing to do did. with that. Well, <laughs> well, Yashin's first Yashin signed for what, I don't know how many years, seven years at like, I was in, out negotiating with Mark Gandler, who was his agent in the Hamptons at a hotel. And uh, we were getting nowhere, you know, nowhere on the contract. And then Charles calls and says, I got an idea. Let's sign him up for it. Like, I think it was nine years, seven million. He said, Charles, you really want to do this? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, I want to, I want him to know that he's going to be here. I got faith in him. And, and, uh, and that's what I want you to offer. It's not my money. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Give it to him. I mean, let's give him. He hasn't played a game for us yet. And so he winds up with that contract. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, he was a player with great talent. And I saw him play one game in Madison Square Garden where he, he was a bull. He got really pissed at the Rangers and dominated the game. It was a dominating performance, but he couldn't sustain it. He just, he didn't have that type uh -huh. of personality. I mean, he was, he was gifted, but... Uh, anyway, um, and the was, checks keep on coming. Yeah, the checks <laughs> keep on coming. So, so that was the first contract I did with Charles, and the next one, he was uh, he was dealing with Di Pietro, and uh, he came in. He said, I, "You know, I'm going to sign him to a 13 year deal or 14 year deal." He said, "What do you think?" I said, I think you're fucking nuts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly what I said to him. I think you're fucking nuts. And he yeah. was to do it. He, but he, 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 was, he was trying to think long-term, trying to build loyalty. Good, good thing to do, but kind of foolish money-wise. Yeah, And it sure. didn't, didn't work out. And Di Pietro did play in an all-star game. Looked like he, he was going to get it. And then he... I don't know if you remember, he had his mic on it on the All-Star game that he was on, and all of a sudden 
he, he, he pushed out his leg and he could hear him yell, oh, fuck. And he yeah. just ripped his leg apart. And he was never the same after that. Never. Right. So, but anyway, that. 15 that, years. Huh, Nux? That would be nice. That's a long oh, marriage. Man. 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> long, you know, like. yeah, no, it was, it was, he's still getting paid. Yeah, I know, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, he's got, he's got, I got a few more years left before they finally get him off the books, yeah. but. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. What's yeah. he doing? But I will now? tell Does you, he do- I will. Uh, he's on the radio somewhere in New York area yeah. uh, doing some stuff. And um, I will tell you, though, like, I was making three quarters of a million dollars. And, you know, I'm, I'm, all the guys, these big guys are making nine, ten, whatever they're making, players, that is. And one day in conversation, I said to Charles, one of these days I want to make a million bucks. I just, in one year, just, just so I can say I did it. So at the end of the year, it was um, not a very good year. We didn't, I don't think we made the playoffs, but uh, he took me to lunch and he said, uh, at the end of lunch, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bonus. I said, well, what for? He said, because you always said you wanted to make a billion bucks. My next paycheck had an extra two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in it. I mean, that, that's awesome! And way to drop the hint, Mike. Way to drop it. I was, uh, I was shocked, but uh, I still have a, I have a little framed copy of that paycheck. It's pretty good. Awesome. The, awesome. the goose that laid the golden egg. Yeah. All right, you were a manager. You were a coach. And you were in uh, for 14 years, NBC, various um, commentating jobs. For you, what was the, I, I guess, the most fulfilling, the the best one for you, the most fun you had? The most fun was obviously playing. You know, it's got to yeah. be. It was just, yeah. you know, you didn't have much to worry about. You know, you get in shape, you work hard, you hang out with some guys, you go to these L.A. And it's awesome. It's just, it was just it was, you can't get any better than that. And second was clearly was coaching because it's as close to the action as you can get if you're not a player. And uh, if you, you know, and then Harry actually, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, sent me to Maine at the end of my playing career and said, you, if you want to be a manager, you should, should coach. You should understand what it's like to be coach. And, and I got there and a little lost for a while, but um, found my way through it and found myself really satisfied with what the the job was all about and uh, came back to Boston as and, and he left me alone Harry too I was GM and coach there so it was fun and, and I came back and and did the job in Boston and then I we just talked about how that ended but um, the managing thing especially when you don't have a cooperative owner can really be a hassle it can really be you know it's full time. You can't get away from it. Like coaching, you, know, you can never put it down. Players put it down all the time. They go to the rink, they practice, and then they meander about. You know, maybe they focus in come playoff time. But uh, the, clearly, that was it. The the the, uh, the broadcasting was fun. I got the chance to do it with Keith Jones, who's one of the funny guys in the world of hockey. Um, but it's shallow. How about Jr.? Did you have fun with Jr.? I had fun with Jr. I mean, Jr. was <laughs> he was he's a piece of work, as you know. But I mean, yeah. I mean, he he came to the rink, not really the rink, the studio, not really having prepared much, and he just let it rip, and yeah. uh, and it, it, it could be fun. And they made him sort of the class clown to have him do yeah. all these sorts of tricks. It was, and he was good about it, but in the end, he. Uh, he got canceled too. Do you have a different perspective on like that coaching role? Like I feel like as a player, it's easy to be like, fuck it, this coach sucks. You know, like every coach could suck at some point, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but you got a different, like becoming a coach, you, it's probably hard. It is. It is. Um, but you got to do the things that you got to do. Harry told me, he, the advice he gave me is you're in charge of conditioning, discipline, and motivation. Uh, the conditioning thing's easy. You just blow the whistle and tell them to get moving and don't let them dog it. And I think you can get respect from the players. They'll, they'll know they need to be in shape. Discipline is not much fun. You know, telling a guy that's not, he, he was out of position or 
didn't get his ass back on the back check. You know, nobody wants to go over and make somebody feel shitty about it, but you, you got to point it out. He's got to know this is, that's not the way we play. And so there's some uncomfortability with disciplining guys, but it, it's like conditioning. It's a must do. You must have it. Without it, you're, you know, it's anarchy. But the art form is motivation. And really, the ultimate tool is your vocabulary, your words. You can't do it like, if you go to the media you're, to yell at a player, you're screwed. If you do it in front of his teammates, he's embarrassed, you're probably screwed. You got to find a way to, you know, occasionally you're going to use those things, sit a guy down or talk about him in the media, not a complimentary way. But if you do that on a regular basis, you're, you're going to lose the team. And if you do do it, you have to make sure you go to that guy the next day and say, hey, this, we're, we're okay. This is going to be fine. We'll get through this little rough patch and then we'll move on to the next game. You know, we're on to Cincinnati, like Belichick says. Mm-hmm. But you unless, you're, unless you're Mike Keenan, Mike Keenan never. <laughs> no, he came. never stopped that. He never. He would like, no. he would like tell you, you're like your wife's fat. Like he, like, you know, what I mean? like you just he, he would just abuse you. But like, uh, well, that's no, the, that, that's why he was at ten different teams or whatever it was. I mean, he yeah. he 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 operated on a fair basis, and I have to say, you know, he won a championship that way at the American league level, at the national league level and at college too, I think he won a championship. So he must've been doing something. right. I, I had him in Russia, Mike. And honestly, like if probably some of the best hockey I played in my career was with him, even though I just fucking was like, the guy was a psycho. It's just like you, he, he was good at it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no, he was, I mean, he was ruthless. Yeah. And, uh, that can last, but after a while it catches up to you. It caught up to him. But not enough to not enough to knock him off his perch and get him another <laughs> job. I mean, he just yeah. kept getting more more jobs right up until the last few years. But uh, that wasn't the way I wanted to go about it. I know the players wouldn't want to go about it. I wanted to go about it the way you know Harry Harry coached us for a little while after he lopped off another coach's head, and he was and he was always hands on. Like you'd be on the bench, you know. A lot of coaches didn't even want to touch you, but he was like he'd have a hand on your shoulder. And, Say, I want you to do it this way next time. I want you to do it that way. And uh, Graves was the same. You know, it was, it was built a better bridge between player and coach. With yeah, the way sure. you talked. Unless the hands end up being a kick in the ass. Um, we saw what happened with uh, Mike Babcock. But, you know, I go back to you and, and, and the motivation piece. And I love that because I remember we were playing shitty and – uh, the next, you said, all right, tomorrow, boys, you want you don't want to work at night. You're working nine to five tomorrow. You're going to see what it's like to work nine to five. You had us at the rink. We went over the game tape. Guys got it. Guys were all bitching and moaning, but they got it, and they respected it. Then the other thing, Tim, get this one. We're in the playoffs, um, um, and we're not playing well, and we're practicing the garden, fucking staying in a nice hotel. The next day, Fucking, we sucked. We get on the bus, all of equipment on. We drive up to this fucking rink in Podunk, fucking somewhere in Massachusetts. Practice at that rink, and then after the rink, we go back. We change. We go back and we stay at this fucking town line in <laughs> shitty little hookah hotel, okay, in Saugus, Mass, on Route One. It was fucking hilarious. You never saw so many guys bitch and moan. I stayed in the same room with Cam Neely and C- Craig Janney. We pushed the beds together. Three of us <laughs> slept in the same fucking thing. There were cockroaches all over the fucking place. And we're like, we better fucking get our act together or we're going to be staying here the rest of the... Well, we won't be fucking staying anywhere. <laughs> but I, we don't I, get actually, going. Actually, we had a good Remember dinner. that, Mike? Yes, I, of course I do. I mean, we awesome. actually went to the, the Colonial Inn where I had everybody drive their cars. Then they got on the bus yeah. to go to the practice rink, so they had no car to drive home from it once they found out they were staying at the <laughs> Town Line Inn. But we did have a good dinner that night. It was just down the street. And I remember looking over, and I said, like, I, I was really second-guessing myself. Did I fuck up here? Yeah. Yeah. So right. I, I, I looked over at Poolin. Poolin was like purple. He was sick as a dog. <laughs> I said, uh, Dave, you, you can go home. I said, uh, Ray, you go home. Uh, 
Andy Bogue, you, he's the goalie. He said, you go home. And, and then I, then this was the killer. Don't ask me why I did this. I said, uh, Glenn Wesley, you can go home. Like Glenn Wesley wasn't the most popular guy on the team. He was a little bit of a no. dink. And, and, and so, but the name Neely never came up, right? I never said, yeah. Neely, you can go home or Jamie, yeah. you can, or an, an island. Everybody else was staying at the hotel. So, and to this day, Neely is still pissed about that. He's still pissed oh, that he got the free pass, right? Drop it. Drop it. <laughs> so so any, funny. I, I'm, I'm, I go back to my room and, uh, I'm I'm standing outside and I'm looking around, trying to check out, see if anybody's going to come by. And this woman comes by and says, 10 bucks, low job. <laughs> <laughs> it was that kind of place. I said no, yeah. but yeah, but Good. after that, I uh, I jumped in my car and I went home. <laughs> and <laughs> then night, you bastard. Had a sleep. <laughs> and I stayed there. <clears throat> um, it's funny. And... You know, I think back, God, uh, the night we were playing Hoff in the playoffs and we were staying in Springfield, and some of the boys went out, and uh, we had a few. There was a curfew, and we're just fucking in there doing jello shots and fucking crazy, right? And who comes walking in? We look, it was all windows out the front of the bar, and we look, and there's fucking Mike walking by with it. Oh, shit, here comes Duna. And he comes walking in. <laughs> he bought us all a fucking shot and left. He said, get home. We did a shot, another shot and we went <laughs> home. <laughs> and we all played the next day. Guilty. But you get it just doesn't happen anymore. No. Like, no. You know? It's a new day and age. Everybody's got their dietitians, And you, you go to the I don't know how they're, they're not all 350 pounds. You go to the rink, you get a full breakfast. You get a private chef there. You practice for an hour. And only an hour, never and more. You gotta than be good. You gotta be really good at video games too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <right. laughs> so, and then you get it. You get the lunch afterwards. I mean, it, it's just. But they they have so much more knowledge, so much more help in terms of keeping their bodies in shape and, and knowing what to do with it. And and the money's so yeah. ludicrous now. I mean, I look yeah. at some of these guys that. Couldn't carry your jock, Chris. So to make what's yeah. the what's the average salary? Close to four now, I think. Yeah, three and a half right. anyway. But yeah. so there's there's a lot at stake for them, and uh, you know, it's a much more it's a much more I guess I don't know if they have anywhere near as much fun, but no. they they are a much more business like approach than than we used to have. Do you like today? What's your thoughts on today's game? You like today's game? It's fast. It's skilled. It's uh, you know, taking out the red line was a, it's a big deal. I mean, it changed a lot of things. It leaves some people vulnerable, but it certainly opens up the game. It, it definitely, I mean, it's it's a watchable product. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna resurrect fighting anymore. Not with the the knowledge we have about concussions and everybody's wearing a face shield and a helmet anyway. So you know, I find it kind of ridiculous. Stupid. Yeah, just what's yeah. the point? I mean, you're not going to hurt anybody that way, or you're yeah. probably going to hurt your hand more than anything else. But so I, I guess I like the game. I know it's I know it's faster. I know the skill sets are are better. Um, but as a player, I would have liked to have played in my era, not this one. Yeah. Could you coach today? And if you could, would you take one of those fucking iPads and just fucking hum it up into the balcony? Because <laughs> I would. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's a. Uh, but it's the it's the accepted practice now, and I I, I wouldn't want yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't go that way. But I I it is they have them on the floor, right? Don't they have them? Some coaches yeah. have them on the floor. Well, the, and, yeah, I wanted to get to this, and I remember uh, back as a player playing for the Habs, and certainly a Boston kid playing for the Habs, and I think back, I and I I say this honestly and earnestly. <laughs> I fucking felt bad at times for Terry O'Reilly, for you, some of the guys, because it always seems like in the playoffs when we beat you, it's always, it was like something fucking stupid. It was a penalty or something, and you could never get over that hump. And I remember getting in the line and shaking hands, and yeah, I was happy to win, but don't get me wrong, but I was always a fucking Bruins fan, and I, you know, I kind of grew to hate them, but I... 
I, but then I felt bad because like, when I really thought of it, because I've been on that side when you lose, it fucking sucks. And then to always lose to the big fucking CH, it must have drove you fucking crazy. In my 12 seasons, the Canadians beat my Bruins seven times. Uh, That's, uh. That is gut-wrenching. But some of them, especially the too many men on the ice game, we were... Our wounds were, as you put it, self-inflicted. Stupid. Yeah. I mean, too many men on the ice. I don't care. We were shadowing the floor. The left wingers yeah. got confused, and we wind up with too many men on the ice. But that's just not paying enough attention or folding under the pressure of the moment. And yeah. uh, so we have nobody to blame. Plus the fact, I mean, I, you know, I look at that roster. Not maybe maybe some of them are gone by the time you got there. But I mean, Dryden is playing goal. He's all yeah. a famer. They got Serge Savard, who was an yeah. unbelievable talent back there. I mean, they had who else was on the blue Lafleur, line? Lafleur, well, Lapointe, yeah, Lafleur, Robinson, Lapointe, shut, and Robinson. Yeah, shot. Robinson's back. Lemaire. Yeah. I mean, so they had a cast of characters, but yeah, that was a battle all the time. And, and and again, I think back now when we're playing together, and listen, and I'm guilty of this being kind of young, ignorant, and not paying attention to Allen Eagleson. And I remember, okay, when Mike Milbury come out and had the balls to come out and say what was going on with Allen Eagleson at the time. Why well, was meanwhile I was fucking every player in the league and no one knew it, but you did. And then you come out and speak and everybody's saying, ah, oh, Milbury, shut the fuck up. Shut up, Mike. You know, what do you know, Mike? And you happen to know a lot, and it all came to fruition. How did that feel for you? Like, everybody, listen, I know you've taken heat over the years, and you're a big boy, thick skin and stuff, but still, that must suck when, especially all the guys, yeah. your, your, your peers, fucking jumping all yeah. over you. Cousin. You know, we, I was the player up in 79, which was the time of the, the, the WHA was taken over. And... You know, I had used the WHA in my negotiations. The, the Whalers came to me. I was making $35,000 at the end of my first contract with the Bruins. <clears throat> the Whalers came to me in the offseason and started making offers. And they got up to, I think, like $95,000. And if they had said $100,000, I'd probably go. But I didn't really want to leave the Bruins. So we went back to the Bruins and finally got a contract for a little under $70,000. They were offering forty five, So they made me a lot of money, the Whalers did. Yeah. And I knew when the league was being absorbed that that leverage, that possibility to go someplace else was going to disappear. That was pretty obvious. And and because of my own personal experience, I knew how much money they, that the Whalers had made me without even paying a salary because their 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 offer was so high. But we went in there, and Eagleson, who was buddies with Wirtz, who was buddies with, with everybody, used to go out on Wirtz's boat and hang out. Imagine the Board of Governors chairman with the head of the Players Union. And, you know, he came back with a fistful of dollars, like some pension benefits, some, some health benefits, but nothing in free agency. I mean, it was really restrictive back then. You couldn't become a really unrestricted free agent until you were 35. And I couldn't I said, buy a six pack. Fuck. Yeah, can't we just, <laughs> we, we can't, we weren't even sharing salaries at the time. You didn't know what to ask for. So we've got to open this up. I mean, he would have none of it. And then finally, you know, that vote was like, he had a, he had a, a special board all of mostly his players that went into negotiations and they came back with this fistful of dollars. And then we voted as a group and the vote was 29 to one in favor. And I was the one against, and uh, I never forget getting on the bus, going to the celebratory dinner afterwards. And I heard Espo talking about the merger. <clears throat> he was talking to Yvonne, Yvonne Conway. He said, you know, Ivana, I knew the merger was already done and that we had them by the by the nuts. But I want to be a general manager someday, so I'm not going to fight that. 
I mean, it was just yeah. like you, if he had shared that knowledge with the group that he knew it was already a done deal, we could yeah. have, we could have held them their feet to the fire for a whole lot more than yeah. than what we got, and what we got wasn't very much. But in the end, you know, uh, I thought Eagleson was going to leave. He threatened to leave, and I actually uh, I got the players and the Bruins to pitch pitch in like a hundred bucks each, and we did a a survey of the players in the league. Asking them, uh, Alan was part time. He was part time as as the head of the union, and doing all sorts of other things, which made it for a very convenient conflict of interest for him, where he could make a lot more hay. But I surveyed the league, and about fifty five to sixty percent of the players responded they wanted a full time executive director. And the second question was because I, I was afraid Al was going to just hire his own successor. So, do you want to have a selection committee? to search out for this full-time guy. And that also was a positive response. But I went to the next meeting and Al must have got pissed off about this. And he went to the next meeting and I had the results of all this stuff. And uh, Phil, again, stood up and said, well, we're giving Al a new five-year contract or some shit like that. And uh, I had all this information laid out, but it was no sense. I was I was pissing into yeah. the wind. So it just... Yeah. I let it go, and in the end, when when he was sent to jail, and they realized he'd been doing all sorts of nasty things with the insurance company, and, yeah. and and all sorts of other stuff, and and you know you can't you can't negotiate for the union and negotiate for individual clients. It's just it's weird. It's a conflict of interest. Anyway, he he got off lightly. How about know? Bobby? Like Bobby Orr, like he could, what was it, 18% stake in the Bruins? That's what's, he was? The story that I told, that I heard was that the Bruins were prepared to make him an offer of 18% ownership of the team. But the problem was they sent Paul Mooney, who's one of the big assholes that I've yeah. ever come across in the sport. So bad, Chris, <laughs> that, you know, he's president of the Bruins. So he gets to park his car up the ramp like they did in the yeah. form in, in the bowels of the, the elephant garden. walk. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that, speaking of elephants, the, the circus would come to town all the time. And yeah. and the bull gang, the guys that do all the changeovers, hated Mooney. So the circus came to town one year, and while he went up to his office, they filled his car with elephant shit. Right oh. to the brim. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Mooney... Good Charlestown guys. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Mooney was sent to see Bobby. The story I heard, like... You have to ask Bobby, but the story I heard was that Bobby was on the bike to get in a workout, and uh, Paul said to him, uh, Bobby, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. And uh, this is supposedly bringing the 18% ownership offer. And Bobby said, fuck off, Paul. Talk to my agent, which was Eagleson at the time. And got kind of nasty, and Mooney just walked out without giving him the offer. Well, I'm assuming he gave it to Eagleson, but Eagleson didn't want him to – for. He, he, he didn't present the offer or it didn't come to pass. Anyway, he goes to Chicago and who's the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks? Bill Works. Works. <laughs> yeah, buddy buddy with uh, with Alan Eagleson. So crazy. It was it was a different time and it was a certainly a dirtier time. I've always agreed with the union leaders in in the past 20 years since Eagleson's been gone or more. But at least they, you know, I think they had the union and their membership in the right place in their minds. They were trying to do the yeah. best they could, if not always in the right way by my sights. But I, you know, he walked away with a ton of money, Alan Eagleson, a ton of money. Yeah, he did. Never had to work again. Got yeah. to, I'm going to stand, he spends a good part of the year in London and is flat yeah. there and comes back to Toronto or I'm sure he's got a, everybody has a cottage in Toronto, right? <laughs> yeah. Cottage yeah. Play, on the lake someplace. <laughs> yeah. So that's my Eagleson deal. Well, we're we're uh, I know we're getting on time here, but I'm supposed to ask a couple, you know, like listen uh, fan questions, and then um, you know, because we might have a listener or two. I know my brother might listen to this, so this is for my brother. <laughs> but um, who are who's the best, uh, the top five best players in your eyes ever? Lemieux, or this will surprise you probably. Messier. Love it. Uh, and I say Messier ahead of Gretzky because if they played head-to-head, -head, Messier would have punched him in the mouth and that would have been the end of the story. 
right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And five, I don't know, you should put a goalie in there, right? Even though they're odd ducks, Marty Brodeur. So that would be my top five. Wow. What about today's game? You know, yeah, it's such a different era. It's hard to put everybody in the same boat, but, um, <clears throat> you know, Crosby's there. Uh, Ovi's a ridiculous goal scorer. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Animal. I mean, he's yeah. An, yeah, he's an animal. And he, and, he's, yeah. and he did, you know, when I was giving him a hard time for a while, it was because he, you know, he'd change, he'd start changing at the face-off circle and go into coast boat. But yeah. Barry Trotz got him out of that. And he became a much more complete player. And, you know, so Crosby, Ovechkin, they're a step ahead of Berge, but Berge's such a complete player. Bergeron is so, so complete. He's uh, just fun to watch him. Some of the newer breed, you know, Toronto came in here last night. You know, you see guys like Matthews, Marner, those guys are, they can fly. Um you know, How about the back end? He's a, Charlie McAvoy is a hell of a player. I mean, he's a hell yeah. of a player. I sense a little Bruins Homer stuff here. Come on, Mike. No, I don't want to be Homer. I mean, <laughs> that kid in Colorado is ridiculous, mate. Boy, yeah, yeah, he is. Oh he is God. good. He is. They're yeah. different types, though, though, right? Same yeah. As, yeah. As, as the kid in New York. Now, I mean, they're skilled, not particularly physical, but. I like McAvoy because he is physical and he can play. Mm-hmm. He can play it all the way around. Um, but a lot of good players in the league. I mean, a lot of good players. M- much more balanced superstars. You know what I mean? There's just yeah. so many of them, not just one or two. Yeah. Of them. They're, they're so skilled. I mean, we haven't even talked about Patrick Kane or Taves. What happened to those guys anyway? Uh, yeah. They just got old. They got to be 30. Yeah, they're getting it. old. Yeah. Christ. They're getting old. But that, that was and- the, fun, the most fun team I ever watched was the Edmonton Oilers. That was just – it was just a I – would, I would go to practice to watch them practice. It looked like it was a, it was a, a fire drill. Everybody was just skating and skating and moving the puck, and it was just fun to watch. I mean, the Bruins. Yeah, Mike, were, that that run though with the Oilers, and you're right. You know, they were like the league is today. They were the fastest team in the league, and there were fast players on every team, but not they. They had it from top to bottom. They, that team was like fast, head and shoulders above everybody else. They were, and the, the talent. And entertaining. And, t- and, and Chicago, yeah. when they had their run, they were kind of the same. They weren't maybe quite as yeah. dazzling, but they were, oh man, that, that was a fun team to watch. And the, 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 the Islanders of the early 80s was a machine. It was, but it was balanced. You know what I mean? It was defense, yeah. offense. It wasn't, you know, you had Bossy and Trotte, but you, you, had, you had everybody back on the blue line playing defense. Yeah, and I saw that John Potvin just passed away. That's too bad. I'm huh? Clark Gillies oh, as well. Yeah. Tough yeah. summer for Islander, old Islander fans. But uh, yeah, we we certainly aren't getting any younger. Like six, <laughs> Mike, sixty four. I'm like, way to go, right? Yeah, well, you're just a pup compared to me. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I'm turning uh, seventy in a couple of months. Jeez, just, how's the kids? The family? Everybody good? Good, good. I, I mean, I had, uh, I. I had four older kids. Now I'm working on my 11th grandchild coming up in oh, another God couple of weeks. And I have uh, awesome. two guys that are just getting, my last two are just graduating from Boston College. One of them actually is in, in Spain. I'm going over to see them this weekend. So I wish they weren't dropping bombs so close by, but I'm going to go anyway. We made the trip yeah. a long time ago, but everybody's everybody's doing well. And, you know, I'm in New Seabury on the Cape where we're across the street from tennis yeah. courts and pool and athletic center and the beach is a mile away and the golf course is a mile away. So I'm hoping I see a lot of them over the summer. What's the handicap at? What's the handicap? The golf. I haven't played enough. To, I really have not played enough golf to establish a handicap. I started when I got here last late July. Um, we hit a couple of rounds that were mid forties, which to me is like acceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, came a couple inches from a hole in one. I was like, 
get the fucking close. Yeah, it doesn't nobody remembers the close ones, right? No, it's like no. losing in the cup final. Yeah. <laughs> Hitting the post, baby. You hit the post. But uh yeah, I am here full time now. I don't know if it was a you know, it's different in the winter. It's people yeah. they go everywhere. But I I have a couple of brothers and a sister at Delray Beach, so I managed to freeload with them for a couple of weeks and break up the cold winter monotony. But uh I think I might want to spend a little more time next winter down south. It's it's nice to be out in t-shirts and shorts, right? Yeah, for sure. You never um, you you, you just took up golf recently, right? Is yeah, that it? just I, unbelievable. I just, I, you know, it's so close, and uh, the, my two youngest are both really avid golfers. So if they weren't, I might not have done it. But I, you know, I joined the club so they could play regularly, and they'll be down this summer. Um, at least one of them, one of them's graduating, getting a job in the construction business. I don't know if you remember Suffolk Construction, Chris. Yeah. A big oh, name yeah. in Boston. And uh, yeah. he starts work with them. Ed Fish. In July. Was that Ed Fish? Owned yeah. I, John Fish, I think it is. I'm John, sure. The yeah. son. Yeah. Ed yeah. was the father. So, oh, yeah. uh, but anyway, that's a big deal for him. He's got to start. Nice to have a job coming out of college. More than I had, by the way. I was just yeah. getting a tryout to training camp. You know, yeah. I, and if that didn't work out, I would have been sh selling fucking insurance or something. <laughs> well, I'm sure whatever it was, you would have been successful. Listen, Mike, before I let you go, you've been awesome with your time today. Um, this statement I read by you, and I want to I want to get a comment about it. I know it's pretty self-explanatory, but I still want you to comment. There are many social inequities in the U.S., and I'm glad they are being addressed. I think we can all agree with that but it has become a tsunami of social change and tsunamis are indiscriminate they'll wipe out the good and the bad in anything in its way and i just don't think that's right it makes heroes out of people who aren't heroes villains out of people that aren't villains and maybe worst of all a social tsunami is too quick to point a finger and too quick to declare guilt by legacy I'm not going to accept that just because bad things happened in the past doesn't mean I've got to be guilty for things that happened today. I don't buy that. I love that statement. The tsunami. Talk to me. Talk to me. Oh, uh, you've, you've seen it across the board. I mean, it's just, it's, it's wild what's happened to, to some people, how they've been mismanaged and accused of things that are just, and we've, we've opened a Pandora's box here. I don't know how we, if we ever get to put it back in, but I mean, social media has become such a tool to damaging people that you might hardly even know. You know, you can get online yeah. and say things and not be account held accountable for it and, and, and hurt somebody else's life in so many different ways uh, that I, f I find it sad that we've come to this. I find it sad and I, I, I don't think it's, I hope we get back to some level of balance. I hope we get some back, to, back to some level of it being a meritocracy. Now, you know, Bill Russell was obviously a great basketball player and, and he came to Boston and all sorts of nasty things happened to him. Um, including, I don't know if you remember the time that somebody broke into his house yeah. and defecated on his bed. And, yeah. and he said, I'm not asking for black people to have an advantage. I'm just asking for black people to be judged on their merits. And I thought that was, and that was a long time ago that he said that. And that yeah. should apply to everybody. Judge me on your merits, not whether, you know, I'm a guy, I'm black, I'm Hispanic or whatever. Judge me on what I've done or what I've what I've said are my intentions, but it's just, it's, it's, it's such a different era. I feel bad for some of the, I feel bad for this generation in many ways that they have to deal with this, this sort of Damocles hanging over their head where it might just lop it off at any moment. It's no way to live. No, yeah, you're guilty until proven innocent. Now it's fucking brutal. You know, like it's scary times for sure. Well, no question. <clears throat> I think we, I think we all have the obligation to fight back, 
to, to, to speak out against such stuff. And if it happens by any chance to happen to any one of you, you know, count on me being there because I know what it's like. Well, I, I can, I know I can count on that. And I said at the beginning of the show that uh, I'd go th through a wall for you because I know you'd go through one for me. No question about it. Mike, um, it's been awesome today. I love that you took the time you did and, uh, um, enjoy the golf when I get back, um, down south and it won't be too long before i'm there we're gonna have to get together and play you got it all right guys thanks appreciate your time mike thank you